एक्सलेंसीज फ्रेंड्स नमस्कार दिस एडिशन ऑफ रायसीना डायलॉग टेक्स ए प्लेस एट अ वॉटरशेड मोमेंट इन ह्यूमन हिस्ट्री अ ग्लोबल पैंडेमिक हैज बीन रेवेजिंग द वर्ल्ड फॉर ओवर ए ईयर The last such global pandemic was a century ago. Although humanity has faced many infectious diseases since then, the world today is under prepared to handle the COVID-19 pandemic. Our scientists, researchers, and industry. have answered some questions what is the virus how does it spread how can we slow it down how do we make a vaccine how do we administer vaccine at the scale and Seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. Good afternoon. Good morning. Good evening. And welcome back to the Raisina Dialogue 2021 for this live session with uh, three very eminent panelists discussing a very contemporary question. The title of the panel: Crimson Tides, Blue Geometries. Um, is basically a, a provocation to discuss the management of a geography that has been come to that we have come to know as the Indo-Pacific. Um, it is a, 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 a body of water that is uh, uh, enticing new fluid partnerships between like-minded countries uh, in a bid to make sure that the waters remain open, inclusive, and free. Uh, choose any adjective you want, and this still works. Uh, at the same time uh, many would agree the region continues to be under institutionalized there is an over politicization in the region but certainly institutions still seem to be keeping pace with the changes of the last two decades this panel will provide a high level view of the emerging geometries of power in the indo pacific and to do that we have with us uh, minister lidrain uh, in charge of foreign affairs in europe uh, for france we have minister marie spain foreign affairs minister of australia and we have dr s j shankar minister of external affairs for india welcome to all of you and thank you so much uh, for joining the raisina dialogue um, we would have loved to host it all of you i know minister lidrain could make it to delhi so welcome to delhi sir but we would have actually loved to have this uh, trilateral take place uh, at the raisina arenas um but let me tell you as an aside that even as we are having this conversation now um a group of thinkers from frs in paris nsc in canberra carnegie india and orf are discussing uh, how to put some beef and meat on uh, this very important trilateral and uh, we hope to be able to give you a set of recommendations post that meeting today for you to consider as we uh, uh, move into the next phase of this very important trilateral um mr lidrain let me uh, start with you Uh, the Indo-Pacific, as I mentioned, is under-institutionalized. What, in your opinion, is the role of a plurilateral arrangement such as that between Australia, India, and France in addressing this gap? Good afternoon to each and every one. Um, hello, Marys. I'm very pleased to see you again. Uh, And uh, hello as well to uh, my colleague, our colleague, uh, Mr. Jashankar, who is in the next studio. We're neighbors. It gives me great pleasure to attend the Resina Dialogue. It is my first attendance. 
And I would like to say that for the first time, it is um, in very unusual circumstances. But I'm very pleased that we can have this discussion about the Indo-Pacific region. And to see once again our friends from India and Australia. And I'm telling you, uh, and strongly so, because I feel uh, very much at ease in this uh, trial, because France, as a matter of fact, is also a territory of the Indo-Pacific region. We tend to forget about it, but we are present. Two million inhabitants, of course, it's not much compared to India, but we do have two million inhabitants in the region of Indo-Pacific. So this is yet another reason for us to play a full role. In this matter, we have a very pragmatic approach. And when uh, we talk about setting up an inclusive area, uh, an area of cooperation, I'm not sure we should always start by talking about some very complex matters, institutional matters. Because if we do so, we waste time and we're never sure what the outcome will be. Whereas pragmatism should lead us, concrete matters being operational and partnerships on a number of topics. And such is the reason why we have a strategic partnership with both India and Australia with uh, on a number of topics, uh, common environmental goods, on uh, and, uh, security, maritime security. There are many things that we share. And we even go beyond. We also have an academic cooperation. We're doing it, the three of us together, we're doing more within this uh, trilateral, and we keep strengthening up our cooperation. I am today in Delhi, and together with our friend, uh, Minister Jay Shankar, we are strengthening what already exists. In addition, we see each other in a more institutional form format uh, within Aurora, which is very much in charge of uh, maritime security. We're also part of the Indian Initiative for the Ocean um, in the Indo-Pacific, launched by Prime Minister Modi. And there is also this initiative of, on uh, illegal fishing and sustainable fishing. We are together with Australia in the fight against um, the financing of terrorism. So there are different networks that add to our willingness to be in these places where we can actually act. And this very much enables us to get into some concrete things without starting with the institutional architecture. And um, this reminds me of the history of Europe. On Sunday, this Sunday, we will be celebrating in Paris the 30 years sorry, the 50 years of the European Economic Community for coal and steel. And this is on a concrete initiative that actually the European Union was based, based on something physical that could be identified and on which we could build. And the Indo-Pacific uh, challenge is quite the same for us. They are different fora and the same willingness of being concrete. Uh, thank you, Mr. Minister. Uh, let me turn to um, uh, Minister Marie Spain. Um, can this new arrangement, we, uh, the minister has laid out a whole uh, ambitious agenda uh, for what we could be doing together, what we are already participating and partnering in. But uh, there is always, always a suspicion that can plurilateral dialogue such as these 
move beyond talk shops uh, and actually um, create tangible change on the ground. Um, does Australia have material objectives for this partnership? Uh, in your own assessment, uh, or what is the kind of ambition and agenda that you want to uh, that you want this uh, uh, troika uh, to imbibe? Uh, thank you, Samir. And uh, can I acknowledge my friends, uh, Dr. Jeshanka and uh, Jean-Yves Vaudrian, and uh, apologise for uh, for not being uh, in India myself. But it is uh, a great pleasure to be at my third Rosina Dialogue. And I want to congratulate both uh, the Ministry of External Affairs and the ORF on bringing the Rosina Dialogue to such an important point uh, of international debate uh, and uh, engagement that uh, that we are all here, no matter what. We get here in one way or another. So, Samir uh, and um, and Jay, thank you very much for uh, your your uh, shared leadership uh, in that regard. Samir, I think Australia has a very practical approach uh, on uh, on an, on an association uh, like uh, like the one we're talking about uh, tonight. Um, when we talk about the circumstances in which we find ourselves now, uh, the specific example of, uh, of addressing COVID-19, our focus is very much on uh, pandemic response and recovery uh, in both of, uh, in all of our countries, and then also in many of the countries with which we engage and to whom we provide support. Uh, we know that we are all most definitely in this together whether it's a focus on uh, vaccines and vaccine distribution, whether it's an appreciation of the economic uh, challenge that will face many, particularly developing nations across the Indo-Pacific. Uh, we, we have a very practical uh, uh, thread to the work uh, we do together. Jean-Yves mentioned uh, maritime safety and security, uh, and both uh, Australia, France and India have, I think, very sound examples of where we have been able to work together, uh, both uh, in uh, the broad Indo-Pacific, Australia and France, for example, uh, in the Pacific itself through the uh, the FRANS arrangement, which often uh, is, uh, is uh, brought together for urgent humanitarian response uh, in the context of uh, extreme weather events like, uh, like cyclones uh, and, um, and volcanic issues and so on. Then we also share a focus, and uh, I know that Prime Minister Modi and President Macron and uh, Prime Minister Morrison have discussed these issues at length on the sustainability of the oceans that we share, uh, the resilience that we have to those disasters uh, I referred to, and also climate change. And then Fundamentally, the value of three nations like ours and three such strong democracies like ours, uh, having the capacity to uh, share our views and share our responses to the pressures that are on regional multilateral institutions uh, currently, the strategic competition that, uh, that we see every day, uh, the challenges, therefore, from both of those that uh, go to uh, against the rules-based order to which we have all, uh, in, uh, in, in different ways, signed up for so many decades now. Uh, it's a very practical approach, but it also has to be very flexible. And, uh, and I think uh, COVID-19 has driven home uh, more than almost anything could have uh, the need for that uh, responsiveness, that flexibility, uh, that preparedness to engage uh, in an event such as this, uh, to have uh, an open discussion about uh, about what is possible, about what we practically do. Mira, I'm not getting you. You are on mute. Can you hear me?
We can't hear we can't Samir. Hear Samir. Yeah, I, I can hear you, Maurice, but I can't hear Samir. Uh, yes. Yeah. Well, tell him. I think maybe the three foreign ministers need to conduct a conversation among themselves. <laughs> well, it's your turn, Jane, so you can. You should. Uh, Perhaps Bossamir fixes his volume, um, his sound. Jay, you could talk about okay. uh, your perceptions, India's perceptions sure, sure, of the, uh, sure. the arrangement. Okay. Look, uh, let me, uh, first of all, it's lovely to see both of you, and uh, I wish we were doing it all together in the same room. Uh, but let me actually build on the remarks which uh, both of you have uh, stated. So I, I want to take it in two parts. One, why do we need plurilateralism right now? And number two, you know, what is Indo-Pacific about? Uh, to my mind, we need plurilateralism because if you look at multilateralism, which is the highest end of it, it's not delivering the way it used to. Uh, if you look at, uh, you know, the, the formal treaty-based structures, and both of you are members of security alliances, uh, that also isn't what it used to be. Uh, and, uh, you, you know, the power of individual nations and bilateral relations is again weaker than it used to be. So the, my point is that, in a sense, there is a sort of vacuum which has emerged, where multilateralism has fallen short, uh, powers are not what they used to be, uh, bilateral delivery is not what it used to be. So it requires... Uh, it requires countries which are comfortable with each other, uh, who see merit in working with each other, and uh, who frankly will make the world a better place by working together, come together. So I would say, well, you know, three of us are talking today, uh, or uh, Maris, you and I deal with the Quad. Uh, as a broad case, I think uh, the world is moving towards groups of countries who are uh, looking to work together, you can call them whatever coalition of the of the enthusiastic, the convergent, the willing. Uh, pick your region, pick your combination. But I think that's where the world is moving. Now, the question Indo-Pacific. Why? Why uh, Indo-Pacific? Uh, I mean, I would argue, and and I, I mean, first of all, I think uh, if all of you want to know what I think about the Indo-Pacific, please buy and read my book. Uh, it has all the answers in it. But for those of you who haven't done it, uh, let, me, let me give you a short version of it. Uh, I think Indo-Pacific uh, historically existed. Uh, it it uh, refers to a seamless world. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, this, this was historically there because if you look at Indian or Arab uh, economic trading, cultural influence, uh, you know, all the way from ASEAN uh, into, you know, Vietnam up to even the east coast of China, historically. Uh, or if you look the other way around, which is Indonesians actually going all the way to the east coast of Africa. So what actually broke up this seamlessness? Uh, some of it was, yes, uh, the empires of that uh, uh, imperial period, but a lot of it was post Second World War uh, politics, uh, and the fact that we, you know, we separated it as Asia Pacific and Indian Ocean. Uh, and I think today, because of globalization, because of rebalancing, because of multipolarity, uh, that because even the the most significant power there, the United States, is willing to work with others in a way in which it wasn't earlier. Uh, we have the the uh, the sort of coming together 
of what was an aberration where they were actually dealt with in a very uh, distinctly different way so i would argue that in a way indo pacific is a sort of return to history uh, it reflects the more contemporary world it is actually overcoming the cold war not reinforcing it uh, so uh, i would very much hope that all of us who would like to uh, run contemporary foreign policies look at it that way excellent can, can i be heard now and can uh, i take yes. the moderator's chair yes. yes you can be heard but not seen but please go ahead oh yes uh, seen you can possibly see me as well but um uh, dr jay shankar i actually wanted to ask you uh, something to do, something very similar to what you just already responded on but maybe more sharp and more direct uh, you have a, a a country which is part of the nato it's a p5 country uh, you have uh, two speakers here who are allegedly from the asian nato um or that's what some people describe it as you have uh, um uh, you know uh, different histories different aspirations different Uh, journeys as uh, peoples uh, how does this plurilateral arrangement this troika give you as the foreign minister of india uh, the room to maneuver the room that you seek to maneuver you have to unmute yourself sir sorry partly in preparation for this panel I actually sat and looked at all the quad meetings uh, that we've attended, and Maris and I have done uh, three of them at a ministerial level. I did some of them when I was foreign secretary as well. So I want to give you a sense of ten subjects which we actually discussed in the quad in the last few years: vaccine collaboration, higher education and student mobility, climate action, HADR. emerging technology resilient supply chains semiconductors disinformation counter terrorism and maritime security mm. now that list will tell you you know what is in our minds and what is what is the purpose of what we are trying to do uh, and when i say the quad i am pretty sure that when we do our trilateral which we couldn't do this time we would be discussing the three of us something very similar so the purpose of coming together is actually frankly to find ways of working uh, for our national benefit for our regional benefit and for global benefit a bit so i i think this idea that somehow because we come together there is some uh, sort of uh, uh, threat or you know uh, messaging to others i i i think people need to get get over this uh, a bit Uh, i as you say i i see a nato member i see a treaty ally they know what that means now i have a very different political history so i i know what i can do and where, what i'm not going to do so and and i i also want to say this look very frankly this kind of you know uh, using words like asian nato etc this is a sort of mind game which people are playing you know i can't have other people sort of have a veto about what i'm going to discuss with whom i'm going to discuss how much i'm going to contribute to the world that's my national choice so so i and and you know that kind of nato mentality has never been india's if it has been there in asia before uh, i think it's in other countries and regions not in mine um let me turn to the uh, french minister so uh, from your perspective since you have already mentioned this impressive roster of activities uh, in the region um, how do you think we should be uh, moving as a grouping uh, to create real tangible progress do you think it's in the area of human development in the area of infrastructure and connectivity or uh, uh, do you think this is a largely political grouping trying to come up with norms for the future first of all first of all i fully share what was said a minute ago by my friend uh, minister jay shankar um as to the fact that we share the same willingness to 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 work together simply because we get along well 
and not just because we share some common interests and because we share some uh, similar concerns and because we're democracies and because we comply with the rule of law. All of that is in our common genes. But on top of it, we want to do it together. And we're doing it in a very pragmatic way. And uh, your comment, sir, uh, the mediator, uh, you were rather talking about the Quad because we are certainly not into any sort of a military um, institution or, or, or format. Mm -hmm. However, security in the Indo-Pacific region is very important to us. Free movement and security of uh, the movements, the security of trade. This is the reason why we share some uh, joint initiatives in order to guarantee this security. We have some monitoring patrols uh, with India, for example, um, off the coast of all the Reunion Islands, Island. We also have a number of initiatives uh, for intelligence sharing with Australia. We also launch some uh, maritime surveillance and missions in partnership with our Australian friends. So in summary, security so that the Pacific can be the Pacific. Mm -hmm. We have this willingness and it is very concrete. That being said, we also, all of us, are extremely active in uh, supporting the, the rise of the blue economy because uh, the luck and, and, and the value of this uh, region, if it is protected, it, it means that there we will still have all the ingredients of the blue economy in terms of energy resources, uh, fishing resources, also uh, for research purposes and innovation, with some specific molecules. So in summary, we all have, um, the, we share this, uh, this field of experience in common. And of course, then come the um, environmental challenge and necessity to have some strong renewable energy based on solar, wind power, or the sea as well. And this is part of our very concrete joint commitments. including uh, all the ongoing reflection on decarbonate hydrogen. This is part of our joint future. Mm -hmm. And I um, wanted to add as well uh, humanitarian assistance on which we regularly work together whenever there is a disaster somewhere. And of course, the fight against pollution and in particular plastic pollution in the maritime environment. Concrete. Co Actions. This is what unites us. The things that can be uh, monitored as well. Thank you uh, very much, uh, uh, Minister. Um, uh, let me turn to uh, Minister Payne. I was going to ask you the question from someone who has sent it to us a few times. His question to you, Anirban Chakravarti asks, how can we strengthen people-to-people -people dialogue in the Indo-Pacific? With the FIFA Women's World Cup in 2023 in Australia and New Zealand, can Australia play a role in using sports as a diplomacy uh, tool? Uh, let me add a small uh, subtext to his question. Uh, do you think it's time India and Australia taught the French how to play cricket? And uh, maybe that could be something that the story lateral could be useful for as well. But none, this is a question to you. And a second question to both Mr. Jay Shankar and to you is that can this group respond to what's happening in Myanmar? Since uh, they, they are a country that's uh, in our part of the world. Um, is there any chance of collective action working together in responding to what's going on in Myanmar? There are two questions that have come for you, um, uh, Minister Payne, so I thought I'd just pose them to you. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Samir. I think the uh, the question about people-to-people -people links is, uh, is a, a very important one, and uh, it starts at the top 
actually. Uh, it starts with a very, very solid sound relationships between counterparts, such as the one that uh, we share, the three of us, uh, between, uh, between uh, not just us as individuals, but uh, our countries, uh, our officials who work together so effectively and uh, demonstrably show the, uh, the value and importance of, uh, of those relationships. Uh, for Australia, many of our people-to-people -people links are uh, created through sport. Your questioner is, uh, is, uh, is absolutely correct. And the FIFA Women's World Cup uh, coming to uh, Australia and New Zealand uh, means that uh, France, India and Australia can all play on the same uh, rectangular field without having to try to teach Geneva about cricket. Uh, and so I think uh, I have uh, I have basic French language skills, but I'm not sure that they will extend to, uh, uh, as John Eve knows, I'm not sure they will extend to discussing what happens when people are in and out uh, and slips and gullies and boundaries and things like that. So uh, I might have to settle for, uh, for football. Um, Australia has a really strong sports diplomacy program. Uh, it's an absolute passion of ours uh, and uh, one which is particularly strong across the Pacific. Uh, another shared interest uh, between, uh, between us, of course, is uh, the pursuit of rugby, uh, is uh, seeing girls, uh, young girls particularly, uh, thrive in non-traditional sports uh, like, uh, well, these days, uh, these days becoming traditional but formerly non-traditional sports. Uh, and of course, uh, we have strong interest in uh, in cycling. Uh, in cycling, I meant to say in uh, in netball uh, as well. Uh, so I think the opportunity to maximise engagement uh, in the region through the Women's World Cup is uh, is a very powerful one. Uh, and in fact, I'm meeting with uh, Football Federation uh, Australia, uh, key to uh, to this process uh, in Sydney next week. Uh, and also very focused on what the legacy of the uh, Women's World Cup uh, looks like. Um, mind you, I don't think it'll ever stop Jay and I being completely competitive on, uh, on matters cricket, uh, tweet by tweet, uh, into, uh, into the future. Um, I also think that the power of, uh, of shared uh, engagement in international education is one which uh, cannot be uh, uh, underestimated. The power of, or overestimated, the power of shared involvement in international education, whether it is uh, students from uh, Australia going out into the region and more broadly uh, into, uh, into places like France, uh, or students from uh, India and France uh, with the opportunity to come to Australia. We know that it's suffered a significant uh, hiccup uh, because of COVID-19 and restrictions on travel and movement. Uh, but I find when I talk to students who are a part of the new Colombo plan in Australia, whose task is to go out into the region and study in the Pacific and in Southeast Asia uh, and more broadly, that uh, they become the most extraordinary ambassadors, uh, both for the new Colombo plan itself uh, but also for Australia and for the countries in which they study. And they are, they are links made for a lifetime, uh, for a generation, uh, and mm -hmm. in fact into, uh, into the future. So I would strongly support uh, those engagements as well. COVID has restricted uh, our capacity to build people-to-people -people links, but we have found virtual ways to do it, uh, as you have here tonight, Samir, with uh, this Rosina discussion. Uh, and we need to maximise those and uh, and make sure we make the most of them. On Myanmar, if I may just... Myanmar, yeah. Thank you. Uh, on Myanmar, this is a, a very challenging uh, and very tragic uh, situation for our friends uh, who had been working so hard on a democratic transition in Myanmar for so long. We've been very clear uh, from Australia's perspective to uh, acknowledge the importance of working with ASEAN on identifying solutions in response to the military coup uh, in Myanmar. ASEAN uh, is key to our Indo-Pacific region. Uh, its centrality is fundamental for Australia uh, and Myanmar is a key member of ASEAN. That said, though, the uh, increase in violence and the increasing number of deaths are deeply concerning. Uh, and Australia, for one, has, uh, has made some changes in relation to our development assistance program, in relation to our uh, military-to-military -military, uh, engagement uh, in particular. 
I do think, though, that uh, I strongly support the bringing together of an ASEAN leaders meeting in the coming week. Uh, that will occur early next week. Uh, and I would hope that, that that has the ability to press upon Myanmar the vital necessity for the cessation of violence, the cessation of the use of armed force against civilians, uh, and for a, uh, a very, very focused uh, examination of, uh, of the options that are uh, put forward by many interlocutors uh, as to uh, ways forward for Myanmar now. But I think we all share our views uh, of concern over what has happened in recent months. Thank you, uh, Minister. Uh, Mr. Jay Shankar, uh, uh, a question by Shailaja Gustav was also directed uh, at you. Uh, let me let me follow the same order: sports, uh, education, because Marie's brought it up, and Myanmar. Look, in sports, you never know where you'll find talent and how that talent would get organized. Because think back, you know, when the IPL started, one of the great finds of that first IPL season was actually a Dutch fast bowler called Dirk Nannis. I don't know if you remember him, though I know Maurice is going to say he's Australian. Uh, right. But he's actually, uh, I think, uh, a kind of a dual passport holder. It sounds much better when you say he's Dutch. Uh, but, uh, you know, but look at Afghanistan again. I mean, to my mind, how the Afga Afghans have embraced the sports. And today, when you look at Rashid Khan, I mean, it's, it's uh, really unbelievable how, how far uh, they've come. So I do see sports uh, as, a, uh, as an important uh, bonding between nations. Uh, I would certainly like to see India, much as I love cricket, to get into more sports than just cricket. Uh, and uh, I think we're doing that. I mean, in a, a, you know, you, you look today, uh, badminton has been a success story. Tennis, which, by the way, I want to tell you was invented in France, uh, was, uh, again, uh, you know, a sports where we've done consistently well for some time. So I, I, I think part of our prosperity, our rise, our development, uh, and a lot of it is something which the government itself is encouraging. We have something called Kelo India and, and Fit India. I mean, these are moments where we tried, even, even ministers try to show that they can make, you know, some, some uh, difference out there. Uh, the education part, uh, you know, today uh, education is at the heart of our relationship with Australia. And I'm very pleased to see it's becoming more and more important with France. Uh, and it make, you know, I, I would compliment the French because they've actually led the way in uh, giving students some kind of ability to support themselves when they study in France. Uh, so, in fact, uh, we, we uh, hold up France as an example to others in Europe saying, uh, can't you do something similar for us? Uh, so certainly when we do our trilateral, I would like very much to discuss education as a common factor uh, between the three of us. Uh, when it comes to Myanmar, I, I, I think uh, all of us, uh, uh, you know, uh, certainly the democratic countries, we, are, we all have a common position in many ways, but also because uh, we are located differently and our relationships with Myanmar are, are each unique. We also have a unique uh, position. Uh, so uh, we, uh, we we seized of it both bilaterally. Uh, I mean, we have a common border and we, we engage uh, with all parties in Myanmar very, very intensively. I should also share with you that we are in fairly regular touch with the ASEAN uh, in terms of what they're doing as indeed uh, Australia is and uh, possibly so is France. So it's something which, you know, all of us will have to find ways of uh, coming together and each sort of doing what they are good at in, in trying to find what is a, 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 a common solution. There is one more question for you. Uh, this is uh, uh, from um, uh, an audience member who basically asks um, that uh, Dhruv Gadavi that since Quad is that very large presence and formation in this region, uh, it, it, he calls it the wind turbine. Do you believe any other grouping is going to be like wind chimes? So how do you create significant plurilateral arrangements that are not overshadowed by the Quad? I think that's the question he's trying to ask. Yes, 
that's for you that's for you to me to you minister yeah yeah that's for you uh, look i i you know uh, i i'm not talking myself down Uh, but i i do want to say that if there's any arrangement which is actually a wind turbine as you called it it is the asean and it is the asean related platforms because if you look at the east asia summit it's a, it's a remarkable platform i mean where uh, much of asia you know the us canada russia europe everybody is out there uh, so uh, in fact uh i i mean if in terms of uh, uh the centrality of any uh, body or platform or a set of mechanisms i think there's no question that asean is and asean will be uh, central uh, to to what is happening uh, uh in in the broader region uh, i wouldn't confuse it with a quad i mean that's really comparing apples and oranges i i think quad has a different purpose because you have four countries very comfortable with each other who who agree on a lot of issues who would like to work together on a lot of issues some of which i spelled out for you uh, but again very if i can switch back uh, you know going back to the uh, east asia summit and asean we have you know tabled the uh, india indo india indo pacific oceans initiative there and i was very pleased that minister ladrian confirmed to us Uh, that france has agreed to lead the maritime resources uh, pillar of it earlier australia had told us that they would lead the maritime ecology pillar japan has agreed uh, to lead the trade and connectivity pillar so uh, i you know i mean these are all today examples of how international relations are being conducted differently uh you know uh with with as i say with softer hands and greater imagination uh and uh, i i think that's that's really the future of the of diplomacy as i look at it may i say something please minister ladrian uh, i please please i'm coming to you you can certainly intervene but there's a question for you also from a gentleman uh is from the audience rishi and he says that there is another quad uh, called the southern quad which is a cooperation between usa australia france and new zealand and what is the status of that um, uh, constellation what is happening there uh, for the viewers in india uh, has that made some progress and of course you can please intervene in what you wanted to uh, say in terms of what the uh, minister jay shankar just shared First of all, I meant to react on on uh, Myanmar. Simply to say once again that, first of all, um, we talk a great deal about it in Europe. There's a lot of solidarity with uh, Mrs. Aung San Suu Kyi. A lot of solidarity um, um, with the um, uh, government that was elected, properly elected, and a lot of uh, protests against the um, the behavior of the junta uh, that came out of the coup and that are uh, continuing with their violent action in a more and more serious manner that being said um, europe did take measures the 27 members of the eu adopted sanctions against uh, the main authorities of the uh, junta they are prohibited from uh, traveling to europe the goods they may have in europe are also uh, uh, frozen or any assets they may have and we also uh, decided um, of a number of sanctions against companies businesses that only operate for the purpose for the benefit of the military i mean of those uh, members of the military and lastly we put an end to our assistance to the government i believe this is a serious attack against democracy in the southeast of asia and we need to maintain the international pressure on a different matter marise and uh, minister jeshanka you talked about sports and education 
we enjoy a, a long standing relationship uh, with Australia on cycling. At some point in time, Australians kept winning everything in France. And Cadel Evans is very popular here. As to the issues of training and education, it is a priority for the three of us. Our Indian colleague mentioned our willingness uh, to put in place in France um, some training sessions for Indian students, uh, training sessions so that they can learn French to begin with. And our target is uh, to have 20,000 Indian students in France because that contributes to cultural exchanges and also to building some sustainable bonds between the two countries with the reciprocity, of course. And with Australia, at the time when we began, it was very much uh, regarding education as well, including Sydney, but also Adelaide. Uh, I did hear a question about the choir, but I'm not sure I got it properly. It's, uh, it's uh, okay. We are, we are running out of time. We have two minutes left. So what I'm uh, going to tell the poser of the question is that questions are guaranteed, answers are not. We will certainly try to attempt it next time. But final thoughts from Minister Payne and then Minister Jeshankar, and we will wrap up after that. So final thoughts from you, um, uh, Madam Minister. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Samir, and thank you both colleagues for the opportunity to uh, to meet virtually like this and to engage in this very important uh, Rosina Dialogue 2021. Uh, it's fair to say that I have spent a lot of late hours uh, in the night and the early mornings here in Australia watching both Le Tour de France and uh, the IPL cricket. Uh, so I, uh, I can acknowledge uh, both of those uh, as... Uh, as a focus for us here in, uh, in Australia. Uh, I think, uh, Samir, I would say that um, the, the, the values that this discussion has, has reinforced, that Australia, like India and like France, wants an open, inclusive, resilient Indo-Pacific region to which we are uh, strong and constructive con uh, contributors, uh, it has been a really important message. Um, from Australia's uh, approach, central to that is uh, is the growing and sustaining of a network of partnerships, whether they're bilateral or regional, multilateral or plurilateral, uh, and in small and flexible groupings like this particular Australia-India-France relationship. I think it's important that we acknowledge that that these new and newer and flexible partnerships uh, can actively complement not compete with existing institutions and alliances and relationships. In fact, they enhance relationships, uh, in my view. Uh, so working together, we have that opportunity to coordinate our efforts to identify practical solutions to the challenges that we face, both the urgent and immediate ones and many of the longer and more strategic ones. So thank you for the invitation from uh, the Rosina Dialogue. I absolutely promise to uh, to make every effort to attend in person uh, on future occasions and uh, look forward very much to the opportunity to do that. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Minister. Can I final word from the Indian External Affairs Minister on this panel, sir? Well, uh, I would also like to thank my two colleagues. Uh, I think uh, uh, this was a good conversation and uh, I would... Uh, uh, I, you know, you asked me what is the way to go forward. I think one way to go forward is for us to hold our trilateral in person quickly. Uh, I'm looking forward to that. Uh, but I do want to say this. Look, Indo-Pacific is a clear message that India will not be constrained between the Malacca Straits and the Gulf of Aden. You know, that our interests, our influence, our activities today go way beyond. When we look at a larger canvas, we see, uh, uh, you know, Australia there, we see France there. France is very much a part of this canvas, historically, culturally, physically. 
there are a, you know a range of uh, activities and uh, projects on which we can all work together perhaps the most important uh, quality we bring to this is really that intuitive comfort uh, that we uh, have uh, with each other as societies as polities uh, as economies uh, so uh, i'm very very confident that what you have seen in the panel today will be seen in diplomacy tomorrow which is the three countries working together uh, and i would very much like to uh, you know see that uh, sort of grow in the in the years to come and i look forward to working with my two colleagues in that regard i think that's a great note to end this uh, discussion on um, words into action and three countries determined to put together a partnership for the future that responds to the needs of the people and puts together a new basis for cooperation in the age of the indo pacific and certainly in the decades ahead so let me please let me thank the ministers for joining us um, digitally let me apologize to the audience for uh, disappearing on you uh, for a few moments uh, this is the perils of the digital age as well but uh, it all ended well and uh, thank you so much again ministers for joining us uh, we uh, i wish you all the best and i wish the french minister a very successful stay in delhi thank you very much and stay tuned for more conversations from the raisina dialogue